Welcome to the CESS meeting. Today's date is February 9th, and we have three topics to discuss today, the first of which is uh, the discoverability of uh, syntactically hidden intrinsics, uh, followed by um, Mark and Peter have, uh, have, have material to discuss about uh, harden, and petrify, and possibly even typed arrays in that conversation. Um, and I have I, I hope to have material to present by the end of the uh, by the end of today to, uh, regarding the consensus that we've developed uh, between Agoric and Modable on um, evolution of the compartment API with regard to dynamic module loading. Um, Matthew. Yeah, um, so I'd like to talk about a hidden intrinsics, uh, actually not the ones that are only discoverable by syntax, but the one that require uh, calling of some APIs uh, with certain values. Um, so this comes up from uh, my work uh, recently. I, I had a normative PR to fix the async uh, wrapper iterator. Uh, and when looking at through the PR, I realized that the async wrapper uh, iterator, which is the iterator that is used it's basically an async iterator created from a sync iterator when uh, you give a sync iterator to for a weight off or yield star uh, in an async function. Um, that iterator prototype is it, it, actually built as a real uh, as an object, and um, those instances and thus the prototype are actually never exposed to user code. Uh, but it's not obvious in, in the spec. Uh, there is a few other objects like this, um, usually a records and things like that, and they're usually marked as being, uh, this is only a um, uh, spec uh, object, it's never exposed to user code. That one actually is not specifically marked as is, uh, but even then, if it was, it would be in some weird section, and then that um, the iterator itself, instance, is propagated inside a record uh, all throughout a bunch of places in the spec. And so it would be impossible uh, to know really if there was an escape anywhere. Um, so having a way to know that some objects are spec fiction and are really never um, uh, exposed as uh, to the user program would be valuable. The reason this came up is someone uh, realized that the uh, iterator helpers uh, actually has proposed currently do expose that object in one very specific circumstance when you do async iterator dot from and you pass a sync iterator it will actually return that um, that uh, wrapped uh, iterator and thus allow the discoverability of the prototype. I'm sorry. Um, could, could you could you repeat that? How do you get the 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 hidden thing? Async dot from providing a sync iterator. It will wrap it and return the wrapped iterator uh, wrapped async iterator instance, and so you get the prototype. And now that prototype is a. Uh, I mean, it's an intrinsic. So uh, and it was. But, how do, you, but how do you get it? A async uh, async you from. You well, call async iterator dot from, which is a proposal uh, so far. It hasn't been implemented in the oh, engine. async iterator from. I got it. Okay. So the iterator helpers. Uh, that proposal has other hidden intrinsics. Um, so when you call any of the iterator helpers and you, uh, so if you do async iterator dot from of a um, uh, async iterator, it doesn't, well, I think it returns, I think it wraps. So under certain circumstances, it returns the iterator right away. Under other circumstances, it uh, returns a wrapped iterator. So there is a uh, wrapped um, iterator helper something prototype um, uh, in those uh, in that in that proposal as well. And it's another place that has a uh, intrinsic that you cannot reach through walking the global. Um, I heard that regex match all has a thing similar to that. I actually need to uh, double check that. Um, so it, it actually happens quite a bit with iterators that those prototypes are not uh, discoverable by uh, syntax. It's actually the case today that the uh, async iterator prototype is uh, not discoverable really by syntax. You have to, it, not discoverable by walking the global, you have to, 
get a async generator and reach uh, the prototype chain of that. Uh, yeah, and so, so that's so, only discoverable by syntax. Yeah, so I think when we when we talk about this topic in, in the past, um, we reference to the two types, those that are accessible via traversal from the global object, mm -hmm. and those that are only reachable by, by, by syntax. Yeah, and I guess there's a third one. Sorry. Um, there's a third one right now, which is uh, discoverable only by calling some API. API, OK. Uh, and for discoverable by syntax or by API, uh, I think I would like to have a way to have a central place where you can discover those. Um, and, sorry. Uh, the, what I was hoping is that the uh, Jordan's get intrinsic proposal uh, would be a way, but um, in one comment, he actually said that uh, discoverability is ex explicitly out of scope of that proposal. Okay, that's very bizarre. The only reason I supported the proposal in the first place was because of discoverability. Yeah. I, I, that was a, remember that Realm uh, had that API where you can get the intrinsics in the past that we remove it in favor of having a, a more explicit API that doesn't require Realm so you can get the intrinsics. Um, I, I'm, I'm more surprised about one of the pieces that you mentioned that it, up, uh, even today, there are intrinsics listed in in the table that are not reachable by by user line code. Is that what you're saying? That that's a, yeah, uh, the the uh, async uh, iterator wrapper is not reachable anywhere by user code, but it's not obvious. Hmm. Yeah, P uh, Peter, um, since you're the engine implementer on the call, uh, uh, do you add the async iterator? wrapper, uh, do you actually internally represent that as a JavaScript object so that um, if it were exposed, it would be, it would just be a, an exposed JavaScript object? Um, I'll, I'll answer carefully because it's a little outside of my, uh, my implementation experience. Um, absolutely everything that XS keeps track of ends up being a collection of slots, which is effectively a JavaScript object. Um, so, Yes, probably, but but likely not directly. Okay, got it. Yeah. So what I would like to bring up at uh, TG three is this problem uh, of. So I, the the concern though is that the this problem really exists in systems like uh, hardened uh, JavaScript. I'm not even sure if the um, if realms and uh, membranes build around realms care about that too much. Uh, that's where you come in, uh, Carity. I, I don't know if it's as yeah, it, it will not matter much for near membrane uh, because in the, in the near membrane and, and at some point we will talk more about that. Probably we can pre prepare something to present. But in the near membrane, most of the intrinsics are mapped, or what we call. Um, um, reflect to the blue or the main realm. So all these, all these things will probably belong to one realm only. And then in the new realm that we create, the new shadow realm, we just ignore most of them and only a handful of them are really used by, by the code running in that realm. So I, 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 will, I will not expect this to affect near membrane, but a membrane, if you want to do something special about those, those type of objects, you, you, you need to have access to, to, to those intrinsics up front to do any kind of remapping. Like imagine that you want to be able to remap one object from one side, one async iterator from one side to the async iterator or the other side in some sort of form, you would need to have access to that. But I don't, I don't, I don't foresee a problem with the membranes. Yeah. So it's it's mostly a problem for uh, for hardened JavaScript. Yeah. Uh, where we want to freeze any. Um, I mean, I guess it is a problem in 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 general because it's it's somewhere where something could get modified. Um, that's a that's a problem. Like something could go in. 
uh, modify the prototype and then the prototype functions are called by um, uh, uh, by by for off and by syntax and now all of a sudden like you uh, somebody could have sub subverted um, the way those operations work. Yeah, but, oh. but at the same time, sorry, Mark, just quickly, if, if this subject is not accessible to user land code, then You're currently, I mean, the the problem is that when it becomes so when uh, but when it becomes you have access to it, you will be able to handle that. So I don't think it's a, a matter of, 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 of missing capabilities of any kind. It's just making no, it's, it's, it, it, it's a It's a software evolution problem. The problem is that you write your, you know, near, near membrane or, or realm shim or whatever it is at one generation of JavaScript. Uh, and then uh, JavaScript changes in such a way that these objects yeah, become right, accessible. Right. And then the code that's under, that's supposedly under your control knows about how to get the new things, whereas your system that's supposedly controlling that code doesn't know about those new things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we have that. Um, um, yeah, I get it, I get it, yeah. Yeah, so I, I guess an attack in this would be um, some code that would reach into that prototype because it knows how to do that, uh, modify the next uh, prototype method uh, to do something funky with it, intercept the results or whatever. And then now every time any other code that isn't aware of it, uh, iterates with a four weight off uh, in the sync iterator uh, would have its results of that iteration uh, altered. Okay. Or observed okay. or anything. Yeah. Okay, so, so, so let, let's just, um, uh, so there's three categories, we can talk about three categories of intrinsic. There's reachable by name, reachable by API and reachable by syntax. That was pretty much already stated. Mm -hmm. uh, the category that the, the, the particular ones that are the new concern here are reachable by API. And the, the question I want, the one question I want to ask just in order to, to bound what the immediate risk is for hardened JavaScript or the hardened JavaScript shim uh, is that um, uh, our, the, the whitelist, the, the hardened JavaScript whitelist removes everything that we don't know about yep. uh, while also logging to the console so we get to flag the fact that there are things that, that, that are, were there that we didn't know about. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but in removing those, um, it may or may not in general remove, at, you know, prevent access to new things that are reachable only by API depending on whether the API by which you reach them are mm -hmm. new methods or whether they're new arguments to old methods. Um, yeah. So yeah. In, the, in this case, uh, would our whitelisting mechanism- It would have, uh, it would have caught it. It would have yeah. caught it, okay, great. Um, nevertheless, I think that obviously what we want from get intrinsics is the discoverability and in fact, Without the discoverability, I don't even know what a motivating use case is for get intrinsics. It seems useless otherwise. The motivating yeah. use case uh, is uh, getting the original intrinsics so that uh, <laughs> um, you don't have to capture them at the beginning of the, you don't have to capture every intrinsics when you start, when your module, uh, in, in your module head, uh, you only have to capture get intrinsic at that point. It depends what the per, why are you capturing them at all? If you're trying to protect against monkey pa against um, against shims modifying things, it's not going to help because a shim will mod will you know get intrinsics by design uh, is built to be modifiable by the same shimming mechanism. Right, so that, it's replaceable. So if you capture it at first, it's basically instead of capturing every intrinsic, you only need to capture get intrinsic. The function. I see. I see. Okay. So you still need to capture it before it gets replaced. Right. But you don't have to do a detailed capture of every individual mm -hmm. thing that you're going to use. I right. got it. Okay. So one, that makes sense. One, one, one small detail is like to, to make it even worse, even mm -hmm. in order to get access to one of these objects that you have to call an API to get your hands on, then if that API is a sync, 
then you have to wait for the next turn to get your hands on that object and then get the intrinsic out of it. That makes it- Thankfully, that's not the case for any of them, but yes. Hopefully, I, hopefully yeah. no, but um, I could imagine that uh, if that happens, like, okay, that, 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 that sets everyone um, up front because you will not be able to capture that synchronously and patch all the things synchronously. Wow, cool. that's, a, that, that's a nice nightmare. Thank you for, for um, I, that one had not occurred to me. Yeah. Anyway, so um, I want to present that problem and uh, present the option of extending the uh, get intrinsic proposal scope to uh, enumeration of uh, known intrinsics. Don't know what the API would look like, but make basically make discoverability in scope. Um, yeah, and, and, and I, 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 I would I would simply require that. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'll, I'll go ahead and, if necessary, voice that I would require that for the Get Intrinsics proposal to go forward, because otherwise it's just not adequately motivated. So when we're talking about enumeration, are we talking about enumerating a single way to get a hold of the intrinsic or something else? Because there are some that are kind of unnamed. We're, we're talking about a... a uh, there needs to be a way to get to all of the intrinsics, for example, all of the intrinsics that are by any other means reachable, otherwise they're not really intrinsics. Uh, uh, they, we need a, uh, a, a, an algorithmic way of being sure to reach them all. For example, for a hardened JavaScript, for a hardened JavaScript shim, uh, for purpose of freezing them, um, obviously, hardened JavaScript becoming a proposal will no longer need a shim at some point, but the shim is, is a nice diagnostic criteria. Uh, other people might want to do other things by reaching all of the intrinsics. Um, uh, so being able to, in a fixed way, know that you're reaching all of the intrinsics ahead of time that any user code might otherwise reach is, is very valuable. Uh, Bradley, can you clarify because um, currently get intrinsic, uh, the spec has a name for everything. Uh, it might not be a, a name visible to user code, but it has a name with the person's uh, uh, basically surrounding. Um, and I believe that's how Jordan has uh, the grabbing, uh, get, probing uh, right now. It's like you do a get intrinsic with that uh, name. And there is like yes. specificities with uh, if there is no nothing that exists for that uh, particular uh, name or for uh, accessors get and set, uh, but that's how it's uh, currently specified. Yeah, so the current stuff covers basically all the normal intrinsic you'd ever want to get a hold of. Um, there are a few like obscure things like what's it, it's it called the thrower function or something in the spec that you don't actually ever get a hold of? Yeah, yeah. I think I think we should limit this to uh, intrinsics that are only accessible to user code. And that was something we discussed at, uh, earlier is making it more obvious in, uh, in the spec that some objects are not reachable uh, to user code. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, just wanted to be sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it, I don't think it makes sense to be able to get access to through that to an object that wasn't accessible to user code first, because the engine might not implement it as something that can be handled by user code in the first place. Um, okay, I think that's it for this topic, uh, and uh, that will be what I uh, will ask for at uh, TG three meeting. Sounds awesome, Matthew. Um, the next topic on the agenda was with Mark and Peter uh, regarding hardening and, and petrifying. Okay, uh, Peter, you want to start? Um, sure. Um, I will summarize uh, roughly, and then Mark, you can um, you can kind of refine that and fix my mistakes. Um, the Mark and I were talking at the beginning before recording started. Uh, about 
uh, discussion in uh, TC39 GitHub that started from array, uh, immutable arrays. Let's, let's, let's keep it to that. And um, the question uh, in that discussion, um, we covered the, the idea of, a, uh, of another integrity level on top of sealed and frozen came up. Um, Modable uses the word petrify for this, so I will, I will use that um, just, just to have a label for it. Um, the, um, the idea is that that uh, integrity level would freeze more things, uh, would, would make immutable more things than frozen does. Um, for example, making an array buffer um, immutable or making a date uh, immutable. Um, that, um, that receives some positive support from uh, people like Jordan, uh, which is great. Um, it seemed the discussion seems to overcome some objections um, that uh, Mark had brought up previously about the broad use of Petrify that Modable does being um, being effectively an attack. Um, and there were I think there's two refinements to to that which um, which came up which are good. One is that um, the the baseline Petrify would be non-recursive. Um, just like freeze is non-recursive and harden brings recursive rules to that. Um, and secondarily, that not every object could have this new integrity level applied to it um, because it would effectively render them um, useless for their, for their given purpose. Um, the examples Mark cited for that um, are promises and uh, weak maps and sets. Um, so and, pro and, 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 and proxies. Sorry, and proxies. Um, and I thought that discussion was helpful because Modable would very much like to see a, uh, a general purpose uh, integrity level um, that, that allows more objects to be fully immutable um, in the language. Um, and this, this seems to give us an opening um, to work on that that has, has at least some, some consensus around it from the early discussion. Um, and then as Mark pointed out in the discussion earlier, um, that would give us having a, uh, a shallow version of Petrify uh, would give us a path to uh, a recursive version of it down the line. Uh, Mark, over yeah. to you. So yeah. So um, uh, also the the other thing that would need to not be included uh, because to include it would be an attack. Uh, the first approximation of it was uh, the private fields of uh, instances of classes. Um, and then uh, uh, you know we all um, and then we all ha had the sense that uh, it would be nice for the class itself to be able to um, uh, to cause those private fields to be frozen. Um, uh, so then Matthew brought up the idea that maybe there's some means, a private symbol or something, uh, some means by which, uh, the, the class code itself could opt in. Um, uh, so, uh, so without trying to be too specific there, let me say that, uh, yeah, I support the idea that a class should somehow be able to do that, whether it's an extension of the same mechanism or distinct mechanism and how it opts in. I think we can, uh, you know, I can po let's postpone that until we get the rest of this straightened out. Um, the, um, so, so what I was suggesting was that the that we take the, the concept of harden as long as we're introducing this harden thing, which is this transitive version of something. Um, right now, it's a transitive application of freeze. Um, we could make the the single step version, the shallow thing, something stronger than freeze, and exactly the, the way that Peter is describing. Um, uh, but that would, but then we should, uh, you know, uh, the, tr the harden that we're proposing, which is the transitive version should just be a transitive version of whatever the shallow thing is. Um, so, uh, so I was just as uh, to have a name for it. I was just calling it hardened step is the, is each atomic step of harden would be a hardened step. Um, uh, and then if we make that a new uh, integrity level, uh, then we, could, we might also be able to bundle in with that, that any property that gets frozen 
that is that is non-writable uh, on an object of that integrity level itself does not cause the override mistake. In other words, uh, uh, it is possible to override that non-writable property um, uh, in an object that inherits from the uh, hardened stepped object. It's possible to override that property by assignment. Um, and um, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm using this terminology to purposely avoid petrify uh, because petrify or shallow petrify or, you know, pe or petrify step, uh, um, since Peter's goal or Modable's goal in introducing that was drawmability, uh, I think that, uh, that it, will be un it will be difficult to untangle that from uh, the issue of enabling attack. Uh, and then finally, there's the, the, th the third API surface, uh, which is the predicate or the, 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 the predicate that doesn't look like a predicate uh, to ask, um, uh, is pure or what are all of the paths by which this thing is not pure or something like that? But that's purely informational. I have thoughts. Um, first, I'm a little still confused into the terminology here uh, or what is being proposed. Are, are you proposing that Harden does something stronger than freeze then? then yes. Uh, I'm, I'm proposing that, that, the, um, that whatever Harden does, uh, the shallow version of it, I'm just using the term Harden step just as a placeholder name for whatever that the, the shallow version is, that harden um, uh, be a recursive application of that shallow step. And then if the shallow step were just freeze, then it would just be a way of describing the harden we've got. But what I'm further proposing is that this hardened step uh, do further uh, um, uh, re removing of mutability, further By locking down of state, uh, but only to the extent that uh, that we can define that further locking down in such a way that it's not uh, we, that we do not take it to be enabling an attack. I. <sighs> I'm somewhat concerned about making, I, I don't understand why we need to make uh, the shallow operation that Harden does stronger than freeze. Um, and maybe that, that's because I, I still have a, um, a difference of opinion on what that operation should do. Uh, and I don't know how we want to call it uh, if it's, since we can't use Petrify. Uh, <laughs> Um, make immutable if you if you wish, or make make mutable on surface because it's shadow. Um, I I think that any operation like that should apply to intrinsics or to user objects the the same way. So uh, so let's so, take let's let's start. So you, you propose that for user objects, for for instances of classes in particular, that there be some way for the class to opt in. That's the only way I can. Well, the only way I can think of it working uh, is have uh, basically a protocol uh, where if the object has a certain symbol on it, that is a function that gets called when this operation uh, gets performed. Uh, and uh, it asks the object to basically do a uh, become immutable um, thing. Um, so, so a map uh, in that case would implement uh, this and basically uh, freeze the map value or whatever slot it has uh, that does it and which would in effect uh, do that, make the content mm -hmm. uh, of that object, the, the, the private content of that object uh, immutable. Okay, so, oh. so I, I want to postpone I think Brad, debating. Brad had uh, his hand raised for a bit, so. Okay, yeah, sorry. This is, this is kind of overlapping my thoughts and everything. 
Uh, I'll preface this by saying, I think some kind of hook mechanism for a class to opt in seems reasonable to me. Um, since you're working on private stuff, it's probably not a public symbol protocol. Um, I'm not sure what that would mean, uh, but public symbols are really painful when once you start dealing with subclassing uh, in this kind of work. And I think some thought needs to be done, uh, especially if some classes can reject this operation uh, on how to get all the classes to agree if they are going to perform the operation rather than have a partial application of the operation. Yeah. And I'm not sure what that looks like. Oh, okay. there's, another, so, there's another uh, question is like, how do you verify that um, the class or the receiver has, has performed the operation uh, to satisfy the semantics of what it's supposed to have done? Yeah, well, so, so, uh, so, 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 so I, uh, let me say that I, I, I echo Bradley's concern. But what I'd like to do is, is to, first buy, to first make a point that abstracts over the specifics by saying, let's assume that there is some some opt-in mechanism that a class could use uh, without, without trying to invent what that mechanism is for the moment, uh, then sure. what I would say is that by default, uh, uh, instances of classes are protected because you have to opt in. Therefore, if you haven't opted in, is, the, is what happens by default is that it gets rejected. And then having, having made that distinction, we can then enumerate the built-ins that we want to protect from this operation versus that we want to be affected by this operation and say that the built-ins that are affected by this operation uh, are um, uh, retroactively rationalized as uh, built-ins that have opted in to be affected mm -hmm. and that the encapsulating primitives like promise, weak map, and proxy are, are, the, are the ones that have not opted in. The ones like array buffer, typed array, date, et cetera, are the ones that have opted in. And oh. that way, the opted in or not becomes a, um, a cross-cutting distinction uh, versus uh, built-in ver and yep. user-defined. Right. Uh, I mean, most likely proxy, you would want the proxy to be able to decide if it wants to opt in or not, and uh, possibly forward that to the target. Um, so it's not probably not a blanket proxy never does, but it's more like proxy is able to handle it. Yes. Um, yes. My concern is still with the point I stated. How so for uh, for the example of proxy and if you try to freeze a proxy and so on, um, there are uh invariance that the engine can check once that has been uh, done it's, it's basically a similar case where um you ask a proxy to freeze and then you check that the proxy has actually frozen if you ask any object to uh become immutable um how can the engine actually uh, check that it has done the right thing uh and that goes in towards the predicate ish uh thing which, as I mentioned, I am not sure is realistic uh, to get in to get specified. So I I somewhat disagree with needing this external predicate. Actually, um, so you can have this operation change how uh, an object works. Let's say this operation is preventing writes to internal slots and private fields. Mm -hmm. Like that could just be enforced if the operation succeeds. If they do not prevent it by returning some value saying they're not going to actually do this operation, mm -hmm. the engine just enforces it as an yeah. integrity mode. We actually That's have this a little field. bit. Like, how do you do this with a uh, weak map? If you uh, use your object instance as a uh, weak map key uh, and store your private data there, or if you store your uh, private data somehow as a uh, closure, how does the engine enforce that those don't get modified? So I don't think that's the goal of this, to my knowledge. 
the, the, I think very much the goal is that things which are built-ins, built-in concepts that are used as encapsulation boundaries are not threatened by this. And closures and class instances uh, and weak maps are all encapsulation boundaries. They're all used for purpose of encapsulation boundaries. And therefore, uh, in this retroactive rationalization would have to be considered primitives that have not opted in. Right, but okay, so let me, let me clarify then. If I have an object that is built as a closure or an object that doesn't, a uh, class instance that doesn't use uh, private fields, but instead uses a weak map, uh, and I claim I implement the protocol uh, to say I, I will accept getting frozen. Uh, and I don't because how, how can the engine enforce that the mutable data that I would store in closure or in weak map uh, is not modified? Yeah, this, uh, th so this is, this is where we get into the, the whole notion of having shallow, a shallow primitive that's stronger than freeze, that affects state that's not visible through reflective APIs is problematic because um, it, once it's not visible, it's not clear whether it's shallow, uh, you know, whether, whether it's at that first shallow step or if it's only reachable more deeply. So for example, um, uh, uh, if we just say that shallow means that the, pri that the uh, internal slots and private fields are not modified, well then the, um, a, a proxy, its internal slots are the pointer at the, the target and the pointer to the handler that never get modified anyway. So a, a shallow make immutable uh, a proxy would already qualify, and that's obviously vacuous. Uh, likewise, with a weak map, the, the, the internal slot is a pointer to an internal data structure. The slot, what, you know, which data structure the slot points to doesn't get modified. Um, so the shallow version of uh, make immutable interpreted literally uh, as applied to a weak map is again vacuous. So I think I think that um, uh, that when we say that these things are um, are not opting in, um, uh, or you know, when we say what it would be that would be made immutable uh, if this operation succeeded, uh, such that it's um, meaningful in the recursive case, uh, I think we we need to dive to some degree into the semantics that we're attributing to these things. Uh, the deep case is the only case I think that gives us a good semantic footing because either the thing, the, either the pointer to the, to the root object of the subgraph is pure or it is not. Either there is mutable state transitively reachable or there is not. And even that has a, a definitional problem around uh, private fields of classes uh, because uh, private fields of classes are given a semantics using the weak map model. And the weak map would be a mutable weak map that is part of the class. So a class defining private fields would without special arrangement have to be considered un you know, something that could not be made immutable because if it were made immutable, then you could not create new instances because if you did create new instances, they would have to modify the hidden weak map. I, I mean, yeah. And so basically that's kind of where I want to get, like, I don't believe it's possible to specify a, even in the recursive case, uh, does this object, can this object reach, or can this object um, reach an immutable state? Um, and I, I, I don't see how that uh, it's possible to, to have a uh, preemptive check uh, like that. Are you worried about, uh, so, so there's two issues. There's, there's whether we can specify it cleanly 
And then there's whether the thing that we specify is something that engines agree to implement. Are you skeptical on the first, whether we could specify something cleanly? I'm skeptical you can specify it cleanly uh, because there are all those cases where something might actually be mutable, uh, but it's not obvious. Uh, it, it might be immutable in practice, but it really isn't. No, it might be, sorry. It might be immutable in practice, but it doesn't appear like it is. Uh, you mentioned one case of that. And then I am fairly confident no engine will actually, well, maybe except for excess, want to implement uh, this. Um, I am, I, I, I think the only, we're more confident that we might be able to like have a uh, boundary that says like, you run, you call this method in a non-mutable uh, way. Like I don't want any side effects when I call this. And uh, there is a shortcut uh, throw that happens if any mutable operation actually happens uh, during that metal call, method call. Uh, I, I think that might be um, implementable uh, because that's already pretty much implemented by, uh, by engines for debuggers. Uh, I don't think anything stronger will be feasible, but that's my opinion. So, um, so you might be right about what engines are willing to implement. Um, uh, on the specification thing, I don't see a problem specifying something cleanly, uh, uh, and I don't even see a problem specifying something that I expect XS would be willing to implement. And that gives us uh, a place to stand where we can start experimenting with it and start, start talking to the other uh, engines about what they would be willing to implement. Um, uh, but your, your second suggestion, I love that, and I've had similar thoughts, which is a right barrier uh, on an operation such that um, uh, if the operation completes, uh, you, know, uh, you know, under this restriction, then you know that it didn't modify any pre-existing state. And, um, and that's a little tricky to define because uh, well, first of all, there's the issue about for um, private fields, where is the mutable state? And I think that a given return override, the mutable state has to be attributed to the class, not the instances. I, I think it doesn't really matter. It's just like you put something on the stack context, uh, on the context stack, and that says like, from now on, nothing can be uh, modified. So there is very few places that's so, modifying something. At least how V8 does it, it doesn't do that exactly because it does actually let you modify things that are allocated during the operations. Right, yeah, yeah, there's that whole uh, and modify things that are allocated and uh, it, yeah, yeah. It gets more complicated actually because things can be put into weak uh, transitions, so weak ref, weak map, mm -hmm. et cetera. As long as that object goes away by the end of it, it still succeeds. Yeah. So. Yeah. But basically some, basically specifying what V8 has for their uh, side effects execution, no side effects execution. I think that might be a little different from what we were talking about this. I, kind of I, I know, but as for immutability, I believe that's a preemptive check. like. Is this operation, does this operation is, uh, does calling this function uh, is completely pure or not ahead of time is impossible uh, to know. And uh, the only thing we can get is a runtime uh, check with a, a short circuiting exception. Once again, it's not impossible. It's, uh, I expect we can specify it. I expect XS will be willing to implement it. Uh, largely already has implemented it, if I understand. Um, uh, and that gives us a place to stand to experiment with it. And you might very well be right that it's impossible to get the other engines to agree, but that's a different level of impossible. Is, is the reason XS is able to implement this because XS is a uh, compile ahead of time uh, JavaScript environment? Um, uh, Peter, I think that's a question for you. No, I don't think that's true. It, I don't, uh, yeah. The, um, the implementation walks the, the current state of the objects. 
Um, so any objects that are loaded, I mean, we do compile ahead of time as an option, but but the state of the VM changes after that and the, the check can be performed at any time. Hmm. I'm wondering why, because when I looked at the V8 code that does this, they're, they're trying to check ahead of time uh, if something is uh, will cause side effects or not. Uh, but they definitely have a mode where like, we don't know, so we're just going to try. And I'm, I'm very curious as to why uh, V8 wouldn't be able to know in, uh, in some cases. We are running up at the app to the hour pretty quickly. So I think that I'll stop the recording here. It's been a great discussion. Um, thank you, Mark and Peter. <laughs>